and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. I'm Andy Hum, and welcome to Gay USA. We are doing our first Skype show, and we're still coming to you on Facebook Live. Uh, welcome. It's a sad and scary time, but we want to be here to communicate with you during it. And we don't want to make you sadder, but we are going to start with uh, some of the people that we lost. Uh, one of the first deaths of a frontline health worker was a gay nurse manager you may have heard about, Caius Kelly in New York. Right, and we also lost this week a fabulous trans activist from Queens, New York, Lorena Borges. Uh, now, New York has let the anti-LGBT Franklin Graham, with his Samaritan's Purse business, set up a COVID-19 tent facility in Central Park. I, I don't know if this is happening with uh, our director in the studio, but Andy, you sound to me like you're yelling a little. I think we're yelling because we don't wear microphones, so I'm going to try to talk a little more gently, and maybe you will too, or maybe I'll turn down your audio. Uh, also, uh, not from the virus, uh, we lost a, a legendary drag queen in Atlanta, Sharon Needles. I... I uh, rush to point out it's not the Sharon Needles from RuPaul's Drag Race, but someone who had the same name and was a legend in Atlanta. And also, not from the virus, we mourn the loss of the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry, 98 years old, the dean of the civil rights movement and a big supporter of ours, of the LGBT rights. Yes, and a uh, new report shows that LGBT hate groups are escalating in numbers, not... Uh, Nice here. Despite the worldwide health crisis, the Singapore Supreme Court found time to uphold the law against gay male sex. And we'll tell you what's happening with some pride events uh, that were scheduled for the end of the month, but are not now. So how are you doing, Anne? Uh, I'm doing okay. I, uh, as, uh, I'm on low-dose anti-anxiety medication. <laughs> <laughs> which I highly recommend for everybody so that you don't freak out during this uh, uh, emergency. And I have enough food and I'm home and I feel lucky to be feeling healthy. Uh, I, you know, I, I thought of one parallel to the HIV uh, epidemic this week, and I'm being asked about that all the time. And there are some things that are similar and some that aren't, and it raises all sorts of questions. But when HIV first appeared, the people who had it didn't know it at first, and it just started popping up uh, because it had such a long incubation period. And then suddenly so many people were sick. And the incubation period of this is not as long, but there are so many people who had it and didn't know it, and it suddenly popped up. And we're finding that some people are just lucky not to have had it all along and uh, others were not so lucky. You're reading and you watch as much as I do, but 50% of the people who are carrying this virus don't know that they have it. Still. And many of them, many of them are not symptomatic, but they are spreading the virus, this, which is why we need universal testing, serology tests, all those kinds of things, if we are ever gonna get this under control. But it's also why we need what we call universal precautions. Yes. And people really need to take seriously this distancing. And I'm shocked at the extent to which people are not always uh, distancing themselves. And to still hear reports on a daily basis that people, even in New York City, are not distancing themselves is, uh, is shocking to me. As you said, um, you know, we're lucky to be, be, be people who live alone, who don't have to go out for much. Uh, and who are not having to work on the front lines of, of the grocery stores or the or the uh, healthcare uh, places, which are just total. I mean, it's a nightmare. My heart breaks for the all those people, and to hear about them getting sick, uh, uh, severely or mildly, 
because they're out there taking care of all the rest of us is just, it, it literally breaks my heart. Yes. And the other thing that struck me, uh, you know, we've been talking about whether Trump is taking this seriously. And the whole press conference yesterday, as we're speaking, uh, where they acknowledge that a good result would be 100 to 240,000 dead. Well, we only have 4,000 dead so far. So if you think this is bad and scary now, wait till what happens in the next month or two. It's going to it's unimaginable, uh, given the strain we put on our health care systems already and all our other systems and people's uh, lack of food and money and uh, housing. It, it's just uh, horrendous. One of my self-care things is not to watch the press conferences live very much at all because they're campaign rallies. And now he's introducing all these corporate chieftains to come up to the podium uh, who were telling us to read our Bibles like the My Pillow guy and things like that. And, uh, and we turned against God. So that's one of my care things. I wait for the news. They'll tell me the worst things he said, maybe anything good that he possibly said. But I, just to sit there and watch that is, and of course, the Fox people do all the time. Well, look, let's get into well, it. I, I, I will just insert that I do the opposite. I watch him. I can't watch the news coverage. The news coverage to me is more alarming. He, watching him seems somehow different and I like to keep my eye on him. So take your pick, do whatever works for you, but uh, do do something that works for you. Don't torture yourself, find ways to relieve yourself in the midst of this. I, I have also found, I mean, I've been living alone for a long time, but set up a bit of a ritual in terms of the way my day progresses, do some of the same things at the same time. So I'm not going to list all the things, but just it helps to have a routine. That's all I will say. Okay. All right. Um, you know, just after we finished taping last week, we learned of the death of a frontline health care worker, a gay nurse manager, 48 years old, named Caius Jordan Kelly of the coronavirus. He died on Tuesday. And his colleagues are saying uh, the hospital killed him, Mount Sinai. They killed him. Uh, the, not enough uh, protective equipment. Some of the people in the hospital were wearing garbage bags to, instead of gowns because that's all that they could get. They lack essential equipment. But I want to. I just want to say, you know, when I saw him pop up as the as the person who died, I had just met him five weeks beforehand. I was uh, working for New Alternatives for homeless LGBT youth. And I don't do a lot of this, but the executive director said, can anybody go over to Mount Sinai and help out one of our kids? Uh, he's in terrible pain. He's not getting help. Uh, would you go over there and advocate for him and exert your white privilege? You know, I was an African-American kid. So I, I went over there. I was there for five hours. I met a lot of nice people who wouldn't do anything for this kid who couldn't even take a sip of water. He was in such agony. And then five hours later, I don't want to start crying again. Caius Kelly shows up. I'm sorry, you know, just trying to control myself. He shows up, very calm. The kid is out of control. He wants to kill himself. Caius just gets him the pain medication, calms him down, and resolves the situation. I mean, I, I so he was somebody I was never going to forget anyone, anyway, and now he's gone. I, I just have to say, you know, I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. But I also read a report that he may not have uh, taken the care to use the protection that was available to him. And apparently had an underlying condition and, and all. But, you know, look, you and I, Anne, were at a, a, a playhouse on March 7th, still going to the theater. You know, uh, uh, you know, we, we can we can talk we can talk about the people that we lost at the winter party, you know, which was March 4th to 10th. And now we have two mm -hmm. dead men from that and, and and about I guess I guess about another 10 or more infected there but that was the time when we were just shifting from oh my god you know what do we do and here we yes are. and how seriously should we take it we were still asking anyway I just want to say uh, that you know you talk about the reports that the hospital killed him I just want to add a caveat to that that well, uh, we'll get more into Mount Sinai when we yes. talk about the Meridans first okay all right. uh, but let's move on to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my list, uh, Lorena Borges, uh, 
59 years old, a trans activist from Jackson Heights, Queens. She was a heroine to the entire community. She had been a hardworking activist for decades, uh, a real uh, icon in the community. And she died of the virus. She was a Mexican immigrant, and uh, she started the Lorena Borjas uh, uh, Community Fund to provide financial assistance to those in crisis, including bond money for people in these ICE detention uh, centers or other detention centers. Uh, she was given the Shooting Star Award for her work with LGBT and HIV positive asylum seekers. So she was a critical part of our community, and it's so, so heartbreaking to lose her. She and and of course, uh, Tuesday, yesterday was trans, international transgender visibility day. She had been arrested and convicted a few times for sex work uh, in her earlier days in New York. And she became such a, an important community worker with the uh, trans community and others in Queens that uh, eventually, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, who everyone is so thrilled with, uh, pardoned her and relieved her of those convictions so that she could continue to do the work and could stay in the country without right. her being deported. I want to read the quote that we put on the screen with her picture, because it's from her, and it says, I don't like injustice. I saw so much injustice, like police arresting our friends, walking in the street, women that lived in our neighborhood, they were deported instantly. Nobody hears them or sees them. We are immigrants. One day I said, no, Lorena Borjas will take care of these women who don't have a voice or a vote. I have the power to rally the people. A uh, terrible loss. And what I also remember from the AIDS epidemic is how impactful each death was and what a hole it left in uh, the lives of those who remained. And each of these deaths is similarly uh, an enormous blow. Right. And then we lost uh, Maurice Berger. He was yeah. a professor at the Center for Art Design and Visual Culture, University of Maryland, Baltimore. He died at the age of 63. Of this virus, he curated the exhibit on modern art and the birth of television at the Jewish Museum and others. Uh, he was cited by his colleagues for his compassion for workers, the poor, people of color, ethnic minorities, women, gay men, and lesbians. And of course, he was openly gay. Uh, and you mentioned people who had attended the winter party in Miami. Israel Carrera of North Miami, 40 years old, is the first reported death of someone who attended that party. Uh, I just, as we, just before we started, I saw there was a second death. I don't have that name. Guy was a guy named uh, Ron Rich, and he was a frequent collaborator with the task force on producing these events. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Israel Carreras, um, you know, had no known underlying health conditions. Well, we are hearing about younger, healthy people. And in fact, there was an infant who died uh, yesterday, I think, who had the virus. Yes. All right. Um, well, we you want to update you on some of the people who are, who are sick with this as well. Yes, yes. We told uh, Go ahead. Uh, Tarlock McNeillis. Yes. Is that the correct oh, pronunciation? Oh, Amazing uh, guy. A gay Irish activist, uh, currently on a respirator at last report. A uh, big bear of a man, uh, totally involved with the Irish lesbian and gay organization, a native of Ireland. And when we, he was part of the protest for 25 years to get us into the St. Patrick's Day parade. And then he became the coordinator of the unit of uh, LGBT Irish from Lavender and Green, who mm -hmm. would march in the parade. Uh, just a, a sweet guy. We send our thoughts out to his, uh, uh, his husband, Juan and uh, hope he pulls through. Yes, exactly. You know? uh, and then there's David Latt. We told you about him last week, the gay legal blogger, 44 years old. He had been on a respirator, but he says he's now doing worlds better than he was. He's out of the ICU. He had been unconscious, but now he's in a different ward. His condition is stable but serious. Some patients uh, get readmitted, he said. And some of, some, of, some of the patients who were let go and then readmitted have also died. That's what he wrote on his blog. 
try to depress people, but we're learning more and more about this virus. We don't know exactly how it works. We're still at the dawn of this. Uh, I don't know if he was ever that sick, but Andy Cohen is out of the hospital and back on TV doing his Watch What Happens Live show remotely with all his guests also remote on Skype or Zoom or whatever. Uh, But he's back and looking hale and hearty, and that's a good thing. And I want to say that uh, one of the statistics that struck me this week is that one third of the doctors on the front lines uh, in our hospitals are immigrants, are people from other countries. And there ought to be a little appreciation there, because think of how we we would be doing without them. And you might want to think about that when you decide who to vote for in November, if they let us well, should we move on to uh, Samaritan's Purse? We can, t- yes, let's talk about that. Okay. So Franklin Graham, we have had occasion to talk about over the years as an anti-LGBT bigot. We've talked about him a lot, actually, because of that. But one of his uh, little projects is he has a thing called Samaritan's Purse as a charitable uh operation. And he, I first heard about him this Would last you- Excuse me. May I interrupt you? It's an eight hundred million dollar business. Okay. Eight hundred million dollars. Because they raise a lot of money. Uh, They go around the world supposedly helping out people medically. They've put up uh, medical tents outside Milan in Italy uh, to help people there, supposedly. So now they have set up tents in Central Park in New York across the street from Mount Sinai Hospital and in collaboration with them are uh, supposedly running a 60 bed operation to help people with the virus. It's not clear to me uh, because I've heard conflicting reports whether they're actually treating people with the virus or treating other people who are overflow from the hospital. I've heard both. I don't know. It is supposed to be a COVID ward, but I mean, the, here's the here's the issue. Beyond the bigotry, I mean, you're not supposed to get a contract unless you certify. We will not discriminate against anybody we serve, and there's trying to say, oh no, no, we'll we'll serve everybody. But you're also not supposed to discriminate in hiring in the and who gets hired to do the services, and they will not say, which is by way of saying, uh, we, we only work with other fundamentalist Christians. That's it, and that's they- that's. They put out a recruitment notice asking for Christian doctors, nurses, medical workers to come help out here in New York. Now, this is high irony when they're working with Mount Sinai Hospital, a uh, a Jewish affiliated uh, organization, uh, certainly non-denominational in their provision of services. Oh, they want to save the gays and the Jews. Uh, Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I saw some video of Franklin Graham like President Trump sending the ship off to New York, Franklin Graham was sending the trucks off to New York with these tents and announcing that his first priority, that Samaritan Purse's first priority, is to bring Jesus to the people. And he announced that in addition to sending these tents and medical workers, they were sending chaplains because he had heard that... uh, People were dying in hospitals, unable to be in touch with their families uh, because of the virus and its transmissibility. So he's sending evangelical Christian chaplains to help uh, to be, you know, at the side of people who are dying. Uh, And in his terms, that means proselytizing for Jesus as these people are dying, no matter what their beliefs are or aren't. I mean... Franklin Graham said on the Hannity show, I didn't watch it, this is a quote, uh, we're going to give them the best medical care we can in Jesus' name. And, you know, the New York State Department of Health approved this contract. Uh, de Blasio says he's going to watch over it. You know, Corey Johnson said, uh, we didn't know anything about it, but we're, we're going to be monitoring it. But they've already admitted that they are not going to allow anybody but fundamentalists to work with them. Now, but what I'm more concerned with is their medical malfeasance around the world. Yes. In Liberia, they set up tents for Ebola, uh, a bunch of things, got a big you know, contract for that. And uh, once one of their staff, or two of their staff actually, got Ebola, they ran. They cut and just ran out of there. Actually, most of the work they do is around food programs around the world, including with the World Food Program. 
uh, in the Middle East, etc. Of course, they don't proselytize with Muslims because they're afraid of them. <laughs> what might happen if they try are you, to? Are they don't proselytize with them. Oh, they're afraid. Uh, they're afraid of that. <laughs> Look, let's be clear. We're in favor of getting help uh, as much as possible from as many different places as possible. But we do not want help that is not medically competent. That's and and that is the bottom line. Uh, can we survive bigotry? Uh, I hope so. But uh, medical incompetence, no. And they were not vetted. And it's a disgrace. And, and it's big advertising to put up these tents with all oh, the tents, say, yes. Samaritan's Purse, From the Skies, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, and these, and what about these evangelical churches that are still meeting, and Liberty University bringing their students and staff back, and the lawsuits saying you're uh, violating our First Amendment rights of religious freedom if you try to stop us from holding these big meetings? Well, the Louisiana, the Louisiana pastors like grocery stores are open. Why can't churches be? Uh, so this Pentecostal preacher down there, Tony Spell, he was given six citations by the local government, and then he went ahead and had another service. So they really need to lock the doors of the church. And what the sheriff down there, or whoever he was, police said is, hey, this isn't just about you and you want to kill yourselves. You're going to infect the whole community with, with this crap that you're doing. And they really have to shut it down. And you're going to overload the medical systems. But I also have to raise another point, which is that when HIV was uh, raging in uh, its early years, there were a lot of people who wanted to quarantine uh, people with HIV or gay people. And now it's a different thing because the transmission is different. But uh, I, I want us just not to uh, leap too quickly to... Uh, to ideas of uh, uh, forcible arrests and punishments when uh, can't we help people separate rather than uh, leap immediately to uh, handcuffs? And some of the people <laughs> are going to hell. I mean, we are losing so much right now. They're c cutting all the environmental laws, the civil rights yeah. laws. I mean, where this is, please. I mean, short term, we've got to just stop this flow. You saw what they did in China. Right. Yes. Yeah. And you see what they did in Italy now, uh, which is uh, was was far too late. And that look at the lockdown that they're on. We need to be on a national lockdown, and we are not. Um, and of course, uh, somebody else who needs to wor worry about this is uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. Did you see? Vladimir Putin met with the doctor who's in charge of the whole COVID response one week ago. They show him shaking hands. They spent the whole day together. The doctor is now infected with the virus, and he spent the whole day with Vladimir Putin. Now, Maybe he got it from Putin. Well, exactly. I mean, uh, well, ex except that I, I say this, and you can call me as snarky as you want, but it, it, remember that the virus only infects human beings. I will leave it at that. Uh, by the way, going back to Samaritans, uh, the uh, in a, they're also setting up a 350-bed a hospital, essentially, at the Billie Jean King Tennis Center in okay. Flushing Meadows, Queens. Nice to see her name in the news. And I want to be clear, I am not in favor of mass religious meetings, but I think we should be thoughtful about getting people to separate. I, I want everyone to separate. I want all that distance between people, but I just don't want uh, martial law imposed if it's not necessary. Because, yep. you know, they'll take this power and they'll continue to use it. They are. They are. They're holding, look, they're holding up the relief funds right now because there's something about foreign aid. I didn't, I didn't yeah. see the whole story. Um, okay. Oh, I have to say, though, that I, I really, Trump made me laugh out loud the other day when he was, you know, he has all these theories about a cure. Uh, all of which come out of his uh, shriveled little brain. But he insists oh, on getting up. He gets up at these press conferences day after day promoting his uh, his cure ideas. It makes you wonder if he has stock in these companies. But uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. But uh, Fauci tried to stop him and said something about, you know, randomized controlled trials, which really are placebo trials he's talking about. And Trump says, Hey, people are dying. Give them the drugs. <laughs> oh, my God. 
not. It's 30 years ago, and Trump is an AIDS activist. <laughs> well, speaking of which, did you read the Larry Kramer interview in the New York Times? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's working on a new play uh, about gay people living through three plagues, he said. He says the government was awful on AIDS, and of course is terrible on this, as we, as we know. He, he says he's friends with Fauci again, yeah. But he urges us to read The American People, Volumes 1 and 2, while we have all this time on our hands. I don't feel like I have time on my hands. I'm oh, please. We're here uh, for two. And just, just in case you're curious, because I had to look to see what the third plague was. Old age, according to Larry. That's the third plague. Guess what, Larry? None of us are going to survive that. Well, speaking, uh, but, of, Trump, uh, speaking, speaking of Trump. Uh, yeah. You just see where Mitch McConnell is blaming uh, the, the, the impeachment proceedings on why Trump yes. didn't respond to this. I mean, come on. Yes, but but again, they're going to be putting out these lines. Uh, and I'm, I'm also deeply concerned about what's going on with the firearms industry seeking to be exempt and be an essential business uh, because people are really buying up guns and ammunition. Yes. I'm, I'm, this is, if you, I'm going to try to freak out, but hey. In Brazil, too. Uh um, a couple more uh, drug stories. Uh, Gilead, uh, which, as you know, is under fire for their the way they've handled Truvada, their PrEP drug, and <laughs> keeping it on the market until the patent ran out rather than bringing in the better drug uh, that they are hol were holding off the market. Well, now they are the makers of uh, one of the drugs that's thought of as a possible treatment for coronavirus, Remsidivir. Uh well, they applied for orphan drug status for that drug from the government so that they could get a lot more money for it and special treatment. And people went, whoa, wait a minute. And there was such an outcry that they had to withdraw their application for orphan drug status for remsimidir. Well, you know, look, during World War II, there was so much profiteering by the corporations. Uh, but Harry Truman, as a senator, held hearings on that. And that's mm -hmm. why Franklin Roosevelt made him his vice president for his fourth term. And of course, he became the president because he saved a ton of money. Why well, are we doing that now? Uh, the I heard they're no, the corporations no, they are, they, calling, they are calling for hearings about the whole tr response. Well, they may be calling uh, for hearings, uh, but meanwhile, the administration is just say, wiping its hands of it and saying, you know, if uh, people, states want to bid against each other for these ventilators, that's not our problem. Uh, and another uh, company called uh, Cepheid, C-E-P-H-E-I-D, uh, they developed a 45-minute test for the uh, virus. Maybe that's off the books now since they seem to have a faster test, but it cost them $3 to make the test. What were they going to charge for it? $19.80 uh, to give it to poor countries. Well, well. We, People are just shameless, shameless we're, in this. How we're, we're talked about how we're certainly not thrilled that Samaritan's Purse wants to come into Central Park, but the U.S. State Department is telling other countries, don't accept medical help from Cuba or you're in trouble with us. Oh, my God. Uh, by the way, mentioning Truvada, some people with uh, uh, who are on PrEP, Truvada for PrEP, are wondering if they're having trouble getting the drug, whether they can go off it in this time of isolation and no partnered sex. And the answer is yes. Uh, if you are not uh, being sexually active in a uh, potentially acquiring HIV way, you can go off PrEP for the moment. And then when you go on it again, you do what is called prep on demand. You take a couple of pills 24 hours before you have sex, and then one 24 hours after, and another one 24 hours after that. And that actually can be the way you use it if you're just having uh, sex sporadically all the time. That's the 211 system. Uh, the CARES Act, I didn't realize it was called that, the relief bill, by the way, and I, people should know this, it does allow nonprofits with fewer than 500 employee, employees to apply. So if you're out there and you're part of such an organization, you should look into that. Uh, by the way, Trump cut out almost all the uh, token funds for elections in the, in the CARES bill. Uh, he, he acknowledged that if adequate funding was made, and this is a quote, 
You'd never have another Republican elected in this country. Uh, that's that show. That certainly tips their hand. Yeah, and that federal CARES bill uh, did appropriate more money for the Ryan White uh, Care Act uh, programs, more money for HIV/AIDS care and treatment, more money for housing for PWAs under the HOPWA Act. Uh, extended the length of prescriptions you can get to 90 days and uh, where oh, I just lost it uh, oh uh, more money for homeless youth both LGBTQ youth and more money for homeless adults yes how does a homeless person shelter in place and according to uh, uh, our director who is still taking the subway uh, he sees a lot of people just sleeping on the subway at this point. Well, there, I heard yesterday about a homeless encampment that was broken up by the NYPD. Uh, just, you know, get out of here. Yeah. And go where? Exactly. All right, we transition into some non-COVID uh, news and maybe start uh, with... Uh, well, uh, I have... Go uh, ahead. Uh, okay, yeah, I think I... Well, the Tony Awards have been postponed. Maybe I should save that for what? entertainment news. <laughs> yeah. The Black Party by the Saint at Large has been postponed to September. And uh, a lot of the pride organizations around the world, which have had to postpone or cancel their plans for June, have decided to hold a big online event on June 27th. That's a Saturday. Uh, that's Global Pride Online. And Curve Media, with which our uh, uh, beloved co-host uh, Maren Johns is involved. She's the editor-in-chief of Curve Magazine. They're holding a global virtual LGBTQIA festival uh, starting now and putting up things periodically. Uh, queer female artists, hundreds of musicians, chefs, comics, authors, fitness instructors, etc. If you go to curvemag.com, Curve Mag uh, you can find about all about the virtual festival. That link and the link to the global uh, media, global virtual LGBTQIA festival in June, all that will be in our email. And a couple of others that I want to mention. Uh, our friend Rex Wachner recommended I watch a half-hour film from the chief doctor in Korea who was, wor who was in charge of this crisis. He's been in the field for 30 years. This is this thing with subtitles. I'm a little impatient with that, but this guy was so calming and so clear and went through the entire thing uh, that I highly recommend that uh, video. His name is, it's called, You Need to Listen to This Leading COVID-19 Expert from South Korea from Asian Boss, uh, Professor Kim Woo Ju. Uh, and uh, I will include that in the email. I wanted to quote from him, just say if I can find it, because I think it was important, but I can't find it. All right. Well, as you're looking for that, I'll also mention that the 23rd International AIDS Conference uh, has been changed to an online meeting. Uh, this is AIDS 2020, uh, July 6th through 10th. That, uh, that whole conference is going to be online. And the uh, alternate conference that was organized uh, to run just before it by people who thought the AIDS conference was too, had become too corporate and elitist, HIV 2020 uh, has been canceled. That was going to be July 5th through 7th in Mexico City. That may end up online too. So look for HIV 2020 and AIDS 2020 online in july oh okay yeah here's uh here's some of that here's from doc here's from dr kim Wu ju uh he said this at the end of it he says this is science you have to be humble the moment we become arrogant we'll lose perhaps europe and the united states were a bit overconfident they might have thought wearing masks doesn't help. And of course, that was the advice up until now. But we have to be humble until the end. It's not the end until it's over. So I really found it good. I hope you check him out, Kim Wooju, and that and that interview. All right, are we done with that? Okay, all right. So, uh, yes, moving, moving on. Well, that we people still are people are still dying of other things, and we lost the drag performer from Atlanta, Sharon Needles. She's died at the age of 61 after a long battle with cancer. 
Her legal name was Edward Smith. She's survived by David Jones, a uh, member of the camp drag troupe, the Amorettes. She was cited for spending 40 years donating her time and talent to spreading awareness and raising actually millions for PWAs. Uh, obviously another huge loss. Now, I admit that when I first heard this, I thought Sharon Needles from RuPaul's Drag Race, because that was a famous contestant on Drag Race, and it turned out to be someone entirely different, but who also used the drag name Sharon Needles. I guess it's popular. Well, and, guess then there's, and then there's the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry, 98, uh, the Dean of the Civil Rights Movement. He's somebody who helped found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with Dr. King back in the day. He campaigned to integrate buses in Mobile, Alabama before Rosa Parks was uh, doing doing it in Montgomery. He, he led the Southern Christian Leadership Conference from 1977 to 97. He was once shot by the KKK. And, but in 2006, and this is what I love about him, at Coretta Scott's uh, King, Coretta Scott King's funeral, she oh, Bush is sitting there. He's the president, and he openly oh, criticized the Iraq War as Coretta had. Uh, with and uh, and he, of course, then when Obama blundered, I don't know what we'd like to think about. Remember when he brought Rick Warren to give the the yes, uh, yes. So the. the to save face, they invited Joseph Lowry to do the benediction at the end of the service, and he spoke up for all people of color, and he's a big supporter of LGBT rights, including marriage equality and the campaign against capital punishment. And, you know, he, 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 he was just uh, 98 years old, and he never stopped. Right. Uh, and he, uh, he, in that speech at the uh, funeral, service he talked about how uh, he we could not uh, expect any good to come out of the Iraq war and money is spent in the wrong ways and all of that so that was pretty impressive uh, we all, and just because we're going through this crisis uh, we have not uh, lost the uh, urge to commit violence against uh, transgender women of color and another woman was killed in New York City this week, uh, known as Lexi, 33 years old, stabbed dead in Harlem. She had been in a fight with another uh, trans woman uh, who, over a pulled wig or something, and uh, the, the other woman came and just uh, stabbed her to death. Both apparently sex workers, and you know we do a lot of these uh, reports about uh, killings. We are forcing people to live on the edge, and th there is a lot of violence in a lot of those uh, cultures because we also don't uh, make se sex work safe for people. All right. Speaking of which, the Southern Poverty Law Center. I don't usually quote them, but the number of anti-LGBT hate groups in the United States apparently grew 43 percent from 2018 to 2019, from 49 groups to 70 groups. But they also noted that overall, there was a drop in the overall number of hate groups. But, you know, you don't really need a hate group now when you can join the Republican. Well, I would say the newest hate group is frozen up on my screen, Andy. I hope I'm coming through. You're uh, the newest hate group is the governor of Idaho. Yeah, go ahead. First, state law uh, forbidding trans girls and women from participating these in school. States have proposed these laws, and the governor proudly signed that in the law. A law that cannot change their gender. All of this done on the International Day of Visibility. Uh, it, it, and because we're all under these stay at home uh, rules, people can go out and protest. But the ACLU will, uh, it turns out that at least one of these laws had already been declared unconstitutional. But uh, these legislators don't care about that. They just want the uh, political gain of passing laws like this. Yeah, your your image is freezing up a bit. Mine looks okay in the corner here. I don't know how it is for the control room, but they will. Uh, I hope we I hope we're getting through. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, in uh, we had a partial victory for HIV positive service members who, uh, uh, in the battle against Trump's ban on transgender. Uh, service members. A federal judge refused to remove the group called the Modern Military Association of America, which is the old service members legal defense fund, from the lawsuit, which means that if they prevail, all service members will be covered. Uh, yeah, that's a great ruling. My only fear is that the right wing groups, which are trying to throw people with HIV out of the military, will appeal that ruling uh, higher up and uh, and they'll overturn that. That's always the fear with the uh, lower federal courts. But another uh, federal appeals court said that a gay man from Ghana who had been attacked there just once could get asylum in the U.S. He did not have to establish any longer uh, history of attacks. Well, so that's good. It was quite an attack. I mean, he was discovered to be in a relationship with another man. Now, this is a, where it's only a misdemeanor to engage in gay sex, but they don't like it. And his family and his neighbors beat him up, covered him with kerosene, threatened to decapitate him. I, you know, and I think, but the lower court judge said, it was it was one thing, you know. <laughs> so the yeah. court of appeals for the Third Circuit said, "No, get him out of, keep him out of there." And then there's, well, uh, and you know, we, 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 I, I I missed this on the Trump front. Uh, you know, his uh, pastor uh, Ralph Dollinger, who we've all read about, he blamed LGBT people for the pandemic. He said, "God's country, this is God's consequential wrath." And of course, that kind of language is what makes people look at us and say, you did this to us. You're the reason I have to stay home all the time. Well, there's a lot of uh, scapegoating going on in this crisis and in all crises. It just seems to be the uh, disgusting human impulse to look for scapegoats. There's the front page story in the Times this week about uh, the uh, memorial service in Georgia where everybody showed up and guess what? They got the virus and now dozens of them are sick with the virus. And what is their response? I wanna know who brought it in. I wanna know who's responsible for this. And, and I'm, that's not blaming us. That's just looking for a scapegoat instead of understanding that uh, things happen and you have to be realistic about it so that you can all protect yourselves. Uh, if you're looking at pointing fingers, you're trying to dissolve absolve yourself of responsibility and that is not how we're going to end this epidemic well i have to say you know I, I i hate the president and i think he's more responsible than anyone for making this about a hundred times worse but let's yeah. all face facts as soon as we read about wuhan why wasn't everybody governors uh, mayors uh public health officials i'm sure there were some op-eds but uh screaming now is the time to put all the emergency plans into place right now. It's not just about stopping a plane from China. It's about do we have enough equipment? Do we if this be, do we have any? Nobody did anything. I Why mean, isn't that a priority all along? This is not the first deadly virus that hits us, and it won't be the last. Nobody did anything. Yeah. Nobody did anything. Yeah, you know, I agree. Uh, uh, meanwhile, back to the educational front, the reason I'm worried about uh, you know what's going on in Idaho and elsewhere, uh, the Department of Justice, not busy enough in this epidemic, not looking at uh, price gouging by corporations, no. They're submitting a statement of interest in the Connecticut uh, school case of trans athletes. Uh, they think that uh, uh, it is the it's bad because biological males are required to compete against the females uh, if the male is transgender female. required to compete. But again, I, I, I keep asking the question, that means that uh, trans boys, who maybe were classified as girls when they were born, will then have to compete against the girls and they will always win. So, you know, what's what's up with that? How you, exactly. what, what, I mean, some of these people say, well, no, I just don't want any trans people at all. But, you know, they don't oh, they don't see that. That is their that is their ultimate agenda. And in Tennessee, uh, a lesbian uh, couple uh, are parents of a son who attends the West Valley Middle School. 
and the son wanted to play basketball. And so he was signed up for the basketball team and he shows up for practice. And guess what? The coach is forcing them into a, an anti-LGBT Teens for Christ program where they all have to meet half an hour before practice and talk about how much they hate gay people and how they're giving their lives to Jesus. This is a public middle school in Tennessee. So the parents are suing because, uh, you know, they're lesbian parents. Uh, and one public service note, uh, fill out the census. One reason we don't have uh, federal funds allocated better is because the uh, we don't fill out the census and there are undercounts everywhere. So just go, whether you have the form or not, just go online to the census and fill it out, please. All right, Annie, you're going to show your picture of Mayor Pete? I'd like to. I hope the control room can do that. Uh, <laughs> Mayor Pete Buttigieg is isolating at home with his husband, Chaston, and he has grown a beard. And I have to say, when I saw this, I thought, oh, my God, he's one of the few people I've seen who, who looks so much better with a beard. I am astonished at how good he looks with it. Uh, I think it's amazing. And evidently, it's getting a lot of support. I think if he had run with the beard, he would have done better. Well, when Lincoln ran for president, he didn't have that beard which he's famous for, and a little girl wrote to him and said, you'd look better with a beard. And so he grew one as president. And that's the iconic image we have now. If and only all politicians. Think, and don't think that Mayor Pete doesn't know that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wish all politicians would listen to little girls. We'd be a better country. Absolutely. Our international news? Yes. So, you know, Singapore did a pretty good job getting their, I believe, their COVID-19 thing under control. But so the Supreme Court felt free to uphold the ban on gay sex anyway. They said it reflects public sentiments and beliefs. And it only applies to men, carries a two-year prison sentence. Uh, you know, George Judge W. Bush once called the Texas sodomy law a good statement of family values. Um, there are 5.6 million people in the country. Uh, two men, or three men actually, have appealed the decision. Uh, you have the Supreme Court, and then you have the Court of Appeals. So I don't know where it ends. Uh, the, the high court, the high court is the court that uh, dismissed the uh, request by the three guys to overturn the law. And the actual quote from their decision is that the sodomy law safeguards public morality by showing societal moral disapproval of male homosexuality, male homosexual acts. Uh, the uh, legal punishment is two years in prison. It's rarely enforced, but they said, we don't care if it's rarely enforced. That's what our society needs to hold as a standard. But the three guys are appealing. Staying in Asia, Hong Kong got a new chief justice who was ruled against LGBT couples frequently uh, and against transgender rights and activists there. You know, they see the courts as really their only hope for any, they're not going to get anything out of the legislature. So they hope to turn the judge around. In Pakistan, a government official has assured the transgender community that they will be protected and taken care of in the coronavirus crisis. It's down to our last 10 minutes. Uh, in, in Turkey, a court in Ankara struck down the ban on LGBTI activities. Now, they overruled an edict by the city's governor in 2018. The, the governor's office couldn't come up with any documents justifying his decision, which so, is like the trans uh, military case yeah, here. Yes, yeah. so the court said there was just no good reason for the ban, so they overturned it. All right. All right. Hey, uh, go ahead. I well, uh, the did international, did you, news and the international trades conference has been put on hold. Uh, excuse me, being put online. Yes, uh, we said uh, that at the top. Oh, well, I didn't. I didn't hear everything you said through this uh, filter. Uh, and then we got a note from our our our, our, our associate producer, uh, Bill uh, Ballman. Uh, you know, basically saying, you know, uh, to take take care of yourself if you've got this thing and uh, and rest and all these kinds of, I, I have a whole thing from him oh wait, wait a minute I have it here um, oh he's criticizing Fauci for uh, pulling drugs off the shelf just to treat this he said it didn't work with HIV and it, and when Fauci did it and it did more harm than good 
uh, you, you need to design drugs that t target COVID at points in its life cycle in the body. That's what he's uh, uh, emphasizing. I watched a show on PBS last night on the polio epidemic, uh, which of course was also a virus. And it took 20 years to come up with the first treatment for polio and another however many years before they really eradicated it. Uh, this is not a quick fix and people need to get real about that and figure out how they're gonna live their lives avoiding this and doing what we can to find treatments, of course. All right, uh, entertainment uh, news? Yes, uh, well, Prism uh, newspaper out in Ohio is shutting down uh, the, LG the only LGBTQ news outlet out there, ceasing publication, and COVID certainly played the role, they said. All right, uh, hopscotching a few entertainment stories. Uh, the Village People's YMCA has been inducted into the Library of Congress National Recording Registry. wonder if Trump likes to use it. No, that's not the one he uses, is it? He uses that, but he also uses Macho Man. All right, Will and Grace is having their finale on April 23rd, and NBC is going to air a retrospective special on that longtime series. All right, in addition to the last episode. Uh, Vita, one of my favorite uh, lesbian shows, is coming back to stars on April 26th for season three. This is about the uh, Latinx uh, community in East L.A. Very original, very captivating. Uh, but this third season is going to be its last six episodes. Uh, Vita, V-I-D-A, highly recommended on stars. Uh, on the season finale of Star Trek Picard... Uh, it reveals <laughs> that a uh, longtime character is queer. Uh, Jerry Ryan's Seven of Nine is the name of the character, uh, who had not previously been identified as such. Such she gets some romance with Raffi, played by Michelle Hurd. Uh, and the uh, young lesbian couple on The Young and the Restless, which had been so happy and then split apart, are back together. Yay! They're young and restless. Uh, I gotta keep on in touch with everything. Debrat, a very well-known rapper who has worked a lot with Mariah Carey and others, finally came out this week. Uh, and she came out in an Instagram post where she showed off the Bentley her girlfriend bought her for her birthday. That was a little over the top in the days of the coronavirus. Uh, but her girlfriend is Jessica Dupart, a hair products CEO. And welcome to the LGBTQ outworld, Debrat. Now we're telling you about all kinds of things you can watch online. And I forgot to mention, if you want to learn more about uh, Lorena Borjas, uh, who died, uh, the, the transgender activist for the, from there in Queens, just Google her, the story of Lorena Borjas, B-O-R-J-A-S, and uh, transgender Latina activist. And we will send that out with the show note. And also the National Theater. You know, I go to London as much as I can, can't go anymore. <laughs> uh, they are making yeah. past productions available online. They always had NT Live, which was shown in theaters uh, on a limited basis. They got the rights each week, starting on Thursdays, they will do a new production. The first one they're going to do is One Man, Two Governors, directed by Nick Heitner. Uh, and it's the th show that made James Corden a star, and it's absolutely hilarious. So we'll put a link to that, but go to, go to National Theater uh, online or YouTube, and you will find it and have fun. I uh, got anything else there? I got, I, I got nothing. I wanna, I'm tired. <laughs> well, yeah, we have a few minutes. Uh, and I do want to encourage you to sign up for our weekly uh, show note. Uh, go to gayusatv.org, although we're having a little trouble with the website at the moment, so give it a day or two. Um, but you can sign up, and we'll send you just one email a week to alert you to what's on this week's show and include extras like those videos we've talked about. Uh, we won't uh, bother you with a lot of emails, just really, truly, just one a week. And it's a good way to get the extra stuff that we can't put on the show on the air. Yeah, I'm just looking to see if there are any more headlines coming. Uh, you got a response from the speaker's office, but it just says thank you for your questions. <laughs> 
I asked questions purse. about the uh, Samaritan's Purse, and I want some answers about this medical efficacy because I'm very concerned that they're really just a PR operation and people are going to be put there for medical treatment and they're not going to get good treatment. And, yeah. and meanwhile, Franklin Graham is just going to pull in hundreds of millions more because of the PR. Correct. Uh, and that's why that's why we're concerned. Uh, uh, well, Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai was concerned enough about the pushback they were getting that they put out a memo to their staff this week saying, don't worry, we're going to monitor them. We pro we made them promise to serve everybody. But as you point out, that if the service is bad, that uh, serving everyone is not the answer. And if it doesn't apply to their hiring practices, that's no good either. And if it is, and it is, again, supposed to be a COVID-19 tent uh, with 68 beds, it's going to be very hard for people to go in there and monitor. They don't let families in. They don't let, I mean, and, and with, with everything else everybody has to do, uh, you know, monitoring that is going to be a problem. But they, they just should have been vetted. I mean, as of the, they were supposed to have opened on Tuesday, by the way, but they didn't because of this, because people are saying, what's going on here with this, with this contract? Yeah. I'd also like to make a plea for governments everywhere to give more help to people in this uh, emergency. And by that, I mean food and money and rent. whatever it takes to, excuse me? The rent. Uh, the rent, absolutely. Uh, but let's help people. Let's, uh, you know, government is supposed to be there to help people. Not as Donald Trump is saying, it's not my responsibility. That's for other people to take care of. I want someone to stand up and say, we want to help people and let's do this together, apart, but together. And, and we want I think that's been sorely missing. And, you know, thank you to all of our viewers who expressed concern for us and told us to stay the hell home, et cetera. Uh, but we are taking care of ourselves. That's yes. this, this is a virus. It can, it can hit anybody. God knows where you can pick. You, know, we, you try to minimize all your contacts and do all, everything you can, but occasionally you do have to shop for food. I actually think, you know, picking up my own food and cooking it is, is safer than like ordering in. But a lot of people can't cook, so they order in, and then other people have prepared it and touched the boxes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but look, as you've said, the main, main risk is being around people who have this, but we don't know who they are. Exactly. And that's why, as with HIV, you have to assume that everyone has it, including you. So you protect not only yourself, but other people and uh, don't put more of a burden on the healthcare system. Well, this is a burden on certainly on everybody. I mean, uh, unprecedented, uh, really, in American history or in U world history, I guess. I mean, there was the... Well. You know, Come black, on, the black, the black plague, the yeah, Spanish flu. People didn't stop working. <laughs> they didn't Big know. Wars. They didn't know to stop working. Okay. The, the, okay. I, I think, think we're, I think we're about done. Am I right? Yeah, thirty seconds. Uh, maybe a few less. Uh, but thank you for joining us. We will keep doing this one way or another. Uh, we're glad you're out there, and we are staying safe here. And we will see you next week. Nice to see you, Anne. And you, Andy. <laughs>